On this week's episode of Where We Are, we'll talk to Politico journalist Adam Wren uh, as he talks us through one of those uh, presidential campaigns that's mystified me a bit. Uh, that is the campaign of Mike Pence. And so we'll hear from Adam Wren, one of the uh, foremost uh, authorities on all things Mike Pence. You're listening to Where We Are. This is where we are. We are the where's. I'm Michael. I'm Melissa. Melissa. Yes. How are you doing? <laughs> doing okay. We've we've had a uh, terrible twos kind of day. Although, honestly, I mean, not that it's ever their fault when they're two. No. But it, this really wasn't her fault. Our poor baby got sick. We drove all the way to Fairfax. Yeah, for a birthday party. For a birthday party. Uh, she got sick. When we got there. And then we had to drive back. And, uh, poor baby, she was just conked out. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I guess the story doesn't make sense unless we actually say that she vomited all over you. Yeah, she vomited all over me. It was the first time I've ever been vomited on by my children, so I can cross that off of my bingo card. Yeah. So, but both the kids are now asleep and we're uh you'll hear you might hear you might hear a little bit of a cameo from Saoirse uh during our our recording because she she came down during the interview yeah Yeah, first first interview that she's interrupted yeah uh because i only tucked her in and kissed her good night and sang her lullaby one time when she was expecting a repeat performance Mm -hmm. and so She's well, incorrigible. She, yes. Hey, Melissa, we have a great interview yeah. for this episode. Uh, Adam Wren, national... Well, actually, I'm going to have you tell the people about Adam Wren. I'm just going to say, I've mentioned on this podcast a number of times that I'm just a little confused about Mike Pence's run. <laughs> and so I thought we yeah. should have Adam on to help us figure that out. And he does. Yeah. Yeah. So Adam is the national politics correspondent at Politico, and previously he was a national politics features correspondent for Business Insider and a contributing editor for Indianapolis Monthly. Uh, his journalism has been published in the New York Times, the, po- the Washington Post, Politico Magazine, The Daily Beast, Longreads.com, and Longform.org. Uh, he's a three-time finalist for National City and Regional Magazine Association Awards, including Writer of the Year, Best Profile, and Best Feature. So he's covered Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020, as well as Pete Buttigieg in 2020. And now his focus is very much on former Vice President Mike Pence, and that's why we're here today. Yeah, and Adam's just all around fantastic guy, great reporter. Yes. Glad to be able to talk to him. Here's our interview with Adam Wren. Adam, so good to have you with us here on Where We Are. Uh, How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm a fan of the podcast. Um, just finished the the John Ward one while I was mowing my grass a couple of weeks ago. So oh, good. Uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Really good to have you with us. And I've been wanting to have you on the show for, gosh, at least a month or so now, mm-hmm. uh, because if uh, there are a few people who could help us understand the 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 mystery the rhyme the reason of uh, of former vice president Mike Pence's campaign just for uh, uh, and so so that's kind of where I want to start start off it was a big lead up into this campaign he had the book I felt like he was really sort of trying out uh, a, a, a message and had a platform to do it unlike some of the other candidates. Um, And then he announced, and I still was unclear on some key dynamics of of this thing. So, so Adam, why is, why is Mike Pence running for president? Well, you know, I think to to start off with the thing that you have to know about Mike Pence is he has wanted to run for president of the United States since he was a little kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is like a widely... Uh, documented uh, thing uh, uh, about Mike Pence. Matter of fact, his hometown newspaper editor 
once said that Mike Pence wanted to be president practically since he popped out of the womb. That, 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 is, a, that is a direct quote. So for starters, like he wants to do this. He enjoys yeah. this. Uh, this is something he, he is a happy, the definition of a happy warrior. This mm. is, this is fun to him. Um, he, he likes to talk to people. He likes to engage mm. people. Um, and this is something he's always wanted to do. So that's really sort of the simplest answer I can give you. Um, number two, I mean, he really thinks that there is a lane for him, particularly, mm. particularly in Iowa where, okay. Two thirds of the caucus goers, uh, as you both well know, are evangelicals, mm-hmm. um, and in many ways, he is the apotheosis of everything the Christian right has wanted in a candidate in fifty years. Mm. Uh, and yet, at the same time, he's not Donald Trump, um, mm-hmm. you know. And so, I think you know the Paul Weirich quote that really stands out to me. Um, I've, I've been thinking about this. It was actually in my colleague's uh, Politico Playbook newsletter uh, a couple of days ago. But, Mm -hmm. you know, Paul Weirich, the religious conservative political activist, you know, once said that he would rather have somebody who isn't one of us who thinks that he elected him rather than somebody who is one of us who thinks he did it by himself. And Pence, Mm -hmm. and and that quote, is the latter. Uh, Yeah. 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 And Donald Donald Trump is the former. Um, Mm -hmm. And so... You're right that there is there are questions um, about why Pence thinks he has a lane, but uh, basically it's Iowa, uh, his affinity for and with evangelicals, uh, and the fact that he wants to do this. Um, I mean, for the first time in his life, he's wealthy. Uh, he had a multi million dollar book deal. This is someone who has lived mm. on a public elected official salary for two decades, two or three decades. Um, he, you know, is wealthy. His kids are out of the house. He can do this. This is something that he enjoys. And so I think those two factors are why he's, why he's doing this. And how, how has he been approaching the, uh, the Trump, the Trump Pence administration? Mm -hmm. And how has he been approaching, uh, the fact that he's running against, the, the guy that he, you know, kind of infamously was, was, I mean, every running mate obviously is, is supporting uh, the top of the ticket, but, but Pence in very difficult moments, uh, uh, seemingly against his, uh, his, his wife's judgment um, uh, d- defended and, and, advocated for Donald Trump to evangelicals. Uh, and now he's running sort of counting on evangelicals saying, take me over the guy I told you eight years ago was, was the, the one who should be president. How, how is he, how is he dealing with some of those, uh, some of, uh, you know, that tangled web? Yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, McKay Coppins, the great Atlantic writer wrote that, uh, Mike Pence created a permission structure for evangelicals to back Trump. And now, and and now he's sort of at the mercy of that permission structure that he created where Trump's most devout followers and supporters do not like Mike Pence, uh, basically because of what he did on January the 6th. Um, and so, you know, Pence has handled this really, you know, in a fascinating and unexpected way. He had a reputation during the Trump years as someone who kowtowed to Trump, someone who, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, was very solicitous to him, um, did, did whatever he wanted him to do. Uh, and then as at his announcement speech in Iowa, he comes out, uh, with a pretty fiery, uh, announcement speech where he berates Trump, says that Trump has walked away from the cause of life, uh, when it comes to abortion rights, uh, says that Trump, you know, is wrong on foreign policy. Mm. Um, and for Mike Pence, in a lot of ways, history sort of starts on January 6th. Uh, we, yes. don't, mm-hmm. we don't yes. really hear a lot of his disagreements with Trump in the four right. years prior to January 6th, which I'm fascinated. That's one of the key things that Me I'm going to Me too, talk. Adam. Me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, he has said uh, in, a, in an interview with Brett Baer uh, a few months back, he has said, uh, you know, when asked about what it's going to be like to debate Trump or be on the debate stage with Trump, he's told Brett Baer, you know, uh, 
it wouldn't be the first time that I've debated Trump. It just so happens that it would be in public. <laughs> and so yeah. my my you know question for him um, is, tell us about all of the times in the White House where you got into it with Trump. Where did you disagree with him? Uh, uh, and how did you counsel him on any number of domestic or foreign policy issues? And I think that's the most revealing thing that we haven't heard yet from Pence, even though he's been willing to criticize him uh, on matters related to foreign and economic policy. Uh, for instance, he's talked a lot about how Trump shares Biden's position on Social Security. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he, but we haven't really heard a lot about the other things he disagreed with Trump about during yeah. his four years as vice president. So that's the big question mark for me. Mm. How do you think his team is preparing him for the first debate, which is in August? You know, that's a great question, Melissa. I think that, uh, to, to be candid, I think that in the debates, Pence is one of the most underestimated candidates on yeah. the GOP side. I mean, this is the only person, um, aside from Trump, who's been in a presidential or vice presidential debate when the stakes are high. Mm -hmm. Um you know, he is a accomplished debater. I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, you know, whatever side of the aisle that you're on, you can say that he did a fairly serviceable uh, yeah. job in debating Kamala Harris in the vice yeah, president sure. debate. Yep. I mean, he is, he is the most disciplined political candidate on the national stage today. Uh, it's impossible to get him off his, his talking points. Mm -hmm. um, someone who is a, a, a radio host uh, in Indiana for 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 years, who oh, right. you know mm -hmm. dealt with live call-ins uh, from you know any number of people. He's he's good at this. He's he's mm. good at debate, and so um, his people tell me that they are really excited about debates with Donald Trump on the debate stage. They think the contrast will be uh, revealing. And what's interesting is even as someone like Asa Hutchinson who was a governor when Pence was um, right. and ran into some of the same religious freedom uh, issues mm -hmm. that Pence did as governor of Indiana on the uh, RIFRA uh, Act, or Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. Uh, you know, Asa Hutchinson has said that that Trump shouldn't be allowed on the debate stage because it because of, uh, you know, the investigation that's mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. at the federal level and, and the indictment. Um, Pence's people don't take that tack. They say, no, we want we want to debate him. Um, and so I think, you know, that first debate uh, uh, later this August is going to be fascinating to watch, uh, particularly that interaction between Trump and, and Pence. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we know he's disciplined. We know that he's been he's wanted to be president for a very long time. One of the other things that I wonder about him as well is we hear about DeSantis all the time that he's not terribly good at retail politics. How is Pence at retail politics? You know, that's another fascinating contrast. Uh, I was with him in Iowa a, a, a few weeks back, the day after he announced at a, at a pizza ranch, uh, pizza ranch, there are about 71 pizza ranch ranches in Iowa. And his plan is to visit as many as possible uh, and meeting with voters. He's mm. actually, he's actually, you know, when you saw him in, in the vice presidential era, uh, when he served Trump, he had this very stiff demeanor, um, yeah. uh, dour, serious, um, but when you talk to people who know him, they say that that is sort of the the outlier Pence, that really Pence is this nice person, funny, uh, apparently a, a good sense of humor. Um, I, I've seen it up close a few times. He's actually really a really good retail campaigner in a way that DeSantis isn't. Um, he likes being with people. He mm -hmm. has a really, you know, pastorly effect when he's with people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, will put his hand on their shoulder um, I watched him once in Iowa about a month ago where he was working a room uh, of Moms for Liberty uh, members, the, the, the group that advocates for education, liberty for, for their students, parental rights activists. And he went up to one um, person and introduced himself and was asking how they were that day. And he said, you know, I once had a pastor who told me that most people are just under encouraged. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to watch him do that. I mean, he's, yeah. he's really, he's really engaging. Um, he's, he's kind of your, I, I, one of his aides, longtime aides once described him to me as kind of your stereotypical sitcom dad, who's a little, <laughs> a, 
a little geeky, uh, a little yeah. dorky, but realizes that about himself. And so one of the big parts of his campaign is uh, going to be tr- uh, his aides trying to reintroduce him to the public as someone right. who's far different than the Mike Pence that we saw as vice president, the mm-hmm. Mike Pence that we knew as congressman for 12 years. I mean, in a lot of ways, Mike Pence is a forerunner of everything that we've seen in national politics over the last decade. I mean, this is someone who was writing about Disney um, and the movie Mulan and how it promoted, uh, he didn't use this word, but a woke ideology in like a 1990 editorial right. um, hmm. for promoting women in the military. Uh, and so he's always been a culture warrior before we even had culture wars. Um, hmm. This is someone who would go on Fox News um, as the third in line in the House uh, as John Boehner's uh, lieutenant, and he would go on Fox News, he would go on Hannity and, and other shows and be the fiery conservative. He opposed George W. Bush's Medicaid expansion. He opposed George W. Mm-hmm. Bush's, um, you know, no child left behind policy. And so mm-hmm. he, he's really sort of an arch conservative in a lot of ways. Uh, and a lot, and it, he'll, he'll even tell you this. He say that he likes to say that he was tea party before it was cool right. to be tea party. And so he's had his finger on the pulse of American politics for a long time. And it just so now happens to be that he's found himself out of step, uh, given what happened on January 6th. Hmm. That's yeah, that that's so fast. Whether he's a forerunner of the politics of today or, or whether, you know, the, the sort of culture where politics today it is a rehash of, you know, some of, uh, and I do see Pence as something of, uh, uh, of of a, of a rehash. I mean, he he was the Family Research Council's guy yeah. in the mid two thousands. Do you sense that? Um, do you sense that there's? Uh, do do they think that that's what Iowa? evangelicals are looking for and that that is going to like win them back from, from Trump? Um, or does he, does Pence have something up his sleeve? Do you, do you see Pence doing anything sort of out of step with the Pence that we knew as, as congressman? You know, I don't, I think in a lot of ways he's trying to remind people of his record as a congressman, um, and he wants to talk about that in some ways almost more than his record as vice president, um, mm-hmm. even though in his announcement speech and other parts of his campaign, he said that he's proud of the Trump Pence record. Uh, he just wants to deliver that without sort of all the drama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in some ways, I was struck in his announcement speech by how much he sounded like an Aaron Sorkin figure where he mm-hmm. said, you know, he's like an Aaron Sorkin Republican in some ways where he said that, you know, he didn't think that the country was divided as the politics that we see in DC. Um, and I, I, you know, I thought that was an interesting reading of the room because that's not my sense at, at all of where people are at. Um, but, you know, he really struck some Reagan-esque tones uh, in his, yeah. in his announcement speech. He's, he cited Reagan a number of times, both his, in his mm-hmm. launch video um, and in his announcement speech. And I just don't know. And as a matter of fact, the only thing he quoted more than Reagan was scripture. Um, and I just don't know if that's where the evangelical, you know, base Trump voter is yeah. at these days. And so I think in many ways, his campaign is a fantastic litmus test for what the mood is of, of, of the party, because if they want, someone who is above reproach in, in, in his personal life, someone who speaks the language of evangelicals, someone who can share his personal testimony uh, on the trail, which he often does. Um, he came to faith uh, at, a, at a Christian music concert uh, outside of Asbury uh, in, in Kentucky back in the 70s. Uh, if they want some like that, he is everything that, you know, I grew up in the, in the Christian, you know, right movement. And Everything I learned about what a president should be, that's who Mike Pence is. And, and that's who he's made himself to become. Like, it's right. so clear that. That's right. Yeah. That, yeah. No, no. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is someone who grew up as a Catholic uh, in an in a Irish Catholic family. 
and you know converted uh you know right around the time where evangelicals started to really gain a foothold in politics uh and so it's just utterly fascinating because really if voters in Iowa reject him you know they're rejecting everything that that the christian right has hmm. has championed in both personal de- deeds and you know public policy uh for 50 years um yeah. So it's fat. that it's so interesting, Adam. And, and you yeah. do get this. I get this sense from his campaign that like this all has to count for something. This all has to be like a part of a, a story God is telling. the The difficulties of the Trump years have to be sort of redeemed, and and I think Pence wants to like make social conservative a uh, uh, social conservatives social conservatism honorable again. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's going to be interesting to see if he's able to do that. I will say he's got some really smart people around him. Like he has some some really bright people uh, uh, around him that are pretty clear eyed about this whole thing. Yeah. Um, I just think it is quite a tightrope to, to, For for him to 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 be on, it's, you know, it's something else. As you noted, I, I picked up that that line from his announcement about we're not as divided as we seem, and it's like you <laughs> yeah. stood back to a president that you stood like to, at the side of a president who seemed pretty intent on <laughs> making clear how divided we were. Um, so no, so interesting. Any anything. Uh, about the Pence campaign, Melissa wisely noted, you know, the first debate uh, is, is you know, a month and a half away about anything, any milestones that you see coming up in the months ahead that we should have our eye on? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see in the next week or so um, how he's faring in Iowa specific polling. Um We've actually surprisingly seen, uh, and 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 post announcement polling bumps have been rare this cycle because Trump has so much of the voter share. But mm. we've actually seen in the last few days some significant movement for Pence. Uh, the last poll I saw, he's at nine percent um, behind mm. Santos. so he's running a pretty strong third. And really, his case is based on his theory of the case is based on Trump and DeSantis getting locked in a murder suicide pact um mm. and you know them sort of taking each other out and him kind of running up the middle in Iowa and so you know if he continues to see you know a polling bounce like this um he's going to surprise people i think in Iowa um but he's he's clear eyed about his chances too um so i think that's one thing to watch and the other thing to watch is you know can he hit 40,000 donors um he's already met the the um RNC threshold for you know national polls to get on the debate stage, but can he get 40,000 donors in you know, 20 different States? Um, mm. I think that'll be fascinating to watch. I do think that um, he has an outside shot of winning the backing of the Coke network. Uh, the Coke network mm-hmm. has said that they're going back to uh, playing in presidential politics after sitting out 2020. And they mm. also said they're not going to be backing Trump. Right. So right. Yes. This is a this is a, a political machine that has operatives in all fifty states that has significant resources from the Koch network, and Mike Pence was their chosen candidate uh, basically to run in twenty sixteen uh, before he ran into trouble in Indiana by passing the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, which critics said b- would allow businesses to discourage uh, gay and lesbian customers from you know frequenting their their businesses. And so he he had that backing once. One of his top advisors, Mark Short, um, is a former Coke Network advisor and employee. And so you know we'll know before the end of the year whether Mike Pence uh, has their backing. And if he does, that 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 could be a a real turning of the tides. I think Tim Scott is someone who is competing for that same. Yep. Yeah. That. yeah. Um, and so uh, it 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 it, re- it will really be something if he's able to you know both increase his, his voter share in Iowa among evangelicals and get that Coke network backing um, that could be something you know that that changes the tenor of the race yeah in, in previous episodes I've talked about 
the fact that this race has a number of sort of primaries within the primary, and and one of them is between Scott and Haley. You just can't see both of them going to South Carolina. Uh, They're not going to risk getting trounced in their own state. It is so one thing that could be very significant for Pence is, you know, I think Haley performs is going to perform less well among social conservatives than Scott. You know, if 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 uh, Haley can beat Scott out before Iowa, if if somehow Scott decides I'm I'm not even going to go into the Iowa caucus, then that could be that could be big for 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 Pence because I I. I do think this is um, this this GOP primary has the fewest candidates who are really cultivating the religious right. Um, uh, I see Scott and Pence really as the, in terms of the elite level. I think Trump obviously is is yeah. likely going to do very well. I think DeSantis taps into like the fighter instinct, but in terms of evangelical donors. They like Pence and they like Scott. Um, and so, so yeah, that's going to be really interesting to see who who gets into the race. Yeah, Melissa. What do, does Pence have? I mean, there, there's a lot of like by osmosis, like it's just in general, like who he is. But what does his religious outreach look like right now on the campaign? Does he have somebody appointed? Anything Honestly, like that? You know, that's a really good, great question. Um, he doesn't have someone appointed yet, but in some ways he's his most effective uh, religious yes. outreach person. I mean, for yeah. example, um, leading up to his announcement, I mean, for months now, a big part of his book tour was going to churches on Sundays, uh, yeah. large churches in the South and the Midwest, uh, mega churches. And he would speak from from the pulpit, from the stage on Sunday mornings um, about his book and his um, South, uh, you know, so he knows this world. I mean, when Pat Robertson um, passed away a couple of weeks ago, he was the first candidate to. Yes, yes, yes. Them. I mean, this is someone who visited Ukraine um, late last year. Uh, mm-hmm with um, Samaritan's Purse, uh, the organization yeah. of, of Franklin Graham. Um, he knows the players better than anybody mm-hmm. you know, as, yep. an, as an outreach person. Also, I mean, Mark Short, his um, his top senior advisor, is a, an adjunct professor at Liberty University. And right. so, um, you know, they are very well skilled in this. Um, yeah. I, I do think that he will, as his campaign expands, I do think that he'll hire someone um, and that's, you know, one of the key things that I'll be watching is who's he going to put in charge of reaching mm-hmm. out to, to these people? Um, yeah. So be- uh, just one other, one other flag. And then I want to ask you about another story that you wrote recently, but um, if this thing develops and, uh, and if, 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 you know, Pence is one of the top two or three candidates, I think, both Karen and Charlotte could play really key roles. I think they're they're weapons in in this in this campaign that uh, other candidates don't have. Um, uh, Charlotte, author, and has become something of a sort of uh, conservative voice for uh, uh, speaking to younger audiences. And then I just think, especially as we've seen sort of parents' rights, education sort of become so central in the GOP primary, Karen Pence seems a pretty ideal person to, to, to connect with voters on that. You know, that's such a savvy observation, Michael. Uh, when I was uh, reporting, you know, a few months ago about Pence winding up to this presidential announcement, um, uh, someone who is, who's been close to Pence for decades uh, told me that, you know, Mike Pence is not listening to polls. He's not looking at polls. He's talking, he's reading the Bible, he's praying, and he's talking to his wife, you know, Karen Pence. And, and so, um, you know, Karen Pence is uh, his closest advisor. When Mike Pence was governor, she had her own office in the state house. Yeah, that's she, right. had, she had a red phone uh, installed on Mike's desk where at any time of day she could call this phone and <laughs> and get a hold of, of Mike Pence. So mm-hmm. and and the note about Charlotte Bond, uh, Charlotte Pence Bond as being pivotal is crucial as well because she's actually co-authoring a book with her dad, um, Mike, who his second book is going to be about 
uh, hit being a family and how, how like advice he's learned to, to raise a family. And Charlotte is going to be writing that with him. Charlotte, let's not forget too, is now a writer for the daily wire, which the, the conservative, uh, Ben Shapiro, Nashville based, uh, out, you know, conservative outlet. And so, um, Charlotte and Karen are going to be instrumental parts of, of this run. And, you know, the first, three days of Mike Pence's presidential campaign, Karen was by his side, not only at his announcement speech, but at every stop he made in Iowa and New Hampshire. And so she's really his chief political advisor. So we're going to hear a lot from Karen Pence. Um, and there is some you know, questions about how she felt about the Trump era. Uh, mm-hmm. A number of, uh, of books documenting the Trump era had this you know, infamous scene with, with Karen Pence that you know, Pence folks deny it ever happened, but basically, you know, Karen was uh, ash ashen faced. As the story goes, when Pence won the vice presidency alongside Trump, and she said, "You got what you wanted, Mike. You got what you wanted." Um, mm-hmm. And she was also, you know, said to be very uh, disheartened by the Access Hollywood video, um, uh, and was almost allergic to to Trump for a number of years, and so. Uh, where she really is today and where she was at the time is an open you know, question. And we'll, we'll see how she influences Mike um, because they're very uh, connected at the hip. Um, they, uh, they are, she is in some ways the most forceful political spouse that we've seen perhaps since, you know, Michelle Obama on the national mm. stage. Yeah. Hey, before we let you go, Adam, uh, can't let you go without asking you about a story you wrote uh, this last week or so on James Tellerico in Texas. You mind telling us a bit about uh, James? I've followed him for a while, uh, and he's someone who's caught my interest before, but I had not seen such an extensive profile until yours came out. Tell us, tell us about James. Yeah, so James Tallarico is a 34-year-old uh, Texas state representative who is weighing whether to run statewide in Texas in the next few years. Um, he's someone who is actually going to seminary. I sat in on a seminary class with him at um, at, at a seminary in, outside of uh, the state capitol in Austin. Uh, it's a Presbyterian, Austin Presbyterian seminary. Uh, he wants to be a pastor. He grew up in a very progressive Presbyterian church outside of Austin. Um, as a matter of fact, his pastor, Jim Rigsby, uh, was someone who was fighting for gay, gay rights, uh, in his own church and was put on trial by the Presbyterian denomination back in the early nineties, uh, which was, you know, far ahead of the, the, yeah. the struggle that we've seen in the, you know, church today. Um, yeah, sure. so, uh, he grew up in a progressive church bring sort of progressive Christian values to the way that he thinks about uh, legislating in, in Texas, was elected as the youngest state lawmaker uh, in Texas at the time uh, before he even turned 30, is a couple terms in. He's flipped a Trump-leaning district um, outside of Austin, suburban district, uh, back in twenty uh, the 2018 midterms. Uh, and so this is someone people look at in Texas and even nationally uh, I've had people tell me that he's likely to be a speaker at the DNC uh, next uh, mm. next summer, um, but he has a real knack for distilling his views on scripture and mingling them with policy, uh, and is a, a real forerunner. He, I mean, this is someone who's uh, ad- advised Beto O'Rourke during his gubernatorial run in yep. um, 2022 about how to handle debate questions. Um, so he's looked to in the party as someone who's a real thoughtful messenger, not only about Texas issues, but matters of, of faith and politics. Um, you know, he's gone viral several times over the last yeah. couple of months for his um, interactions with Republicans in the Texas State House during their session, both on issues uh, of gun rights and, you know, the Ten Commandments um, in, you know, having them displayed in all public classrooms in Texas, which he opposed. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and talks a lot about Christian nationalism in interesting ways. And so he's going to be someone, I think, who we're going to see have an impact on politics for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Super interesting story. I mean, I think it's it's notable. Uh, people like James, Mallory McMorrow up in Michigan, 
uh, it's not a mistake that these figures are are rising and that national democratic strategists uh, there's 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 something they like, but we'll maybe unpack that in a later <laughs> episode. Uh, for now, the best you could do is uh, read Adam's profile of James in Politico. James, uh, Adam is the one to follow uh, for many things in our politics, but uh, I, I, I'll read him uh, anything he writes about uh, Pence uh, in, in the weeks and months ahead. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. All right, Melissa, I don't know about you, but I feel like I uh, get Pence uh, uh, and his his campaign a bit more after that. Yes, after that I definitely do. There were several details that Adam shared that I didn't know about or had completely forgotten about. Yeah, no, so uh, very helpful. And uh, yeah, that Tellerico article, folks should definitely check it out. It's interesting. Yeah, I love a good profile. Love a good profile. All right, well, folks, that's all we have for you for this week's episode of Where We Are. As always, would love for you to leave a review, uh, let people know you listen to the podcast. I'll be back for the Morning Five this week. I was... uh, travel just caught up with me i missed a few episodes last week although i am thinking melissa i can't do that because now our our listeners are trained to think that i've broken uh, a bone Uh, (laughs) that there's something seriously wrong it's like i should put out a little 10 second pod just saying he's okay people yes Uh, but yeah it was just i was on the west coast it's crazy uh you're in colorado and then california yeah but i'll i'll be back i'll be back for the morning five this week. Until then, you've been listening to Where We Are. Bye.